Hello and welcome to the Always Be Testing podcast. I'm your host, Ty DeGrange. With me today is Tom Salisbury Hunter from Commission Junction. We're super excited to get going. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited to have you. Uh, Always Be Testing pod where we talk about the growth, performance marketing, testing, experiments in business and in life. Um, Super excited about this episode to dive in with Tom Salisbury Hunter, the Vice President of Client Services at Commission Junction. Welcome again and uh, ready to dive into it with you. Yeah, me too. Been looking forward to this. Heck yeah. So give a little bit of background on kind of just the basics of what you do high level for the audience. Uh, We have a lot of performance marketers, growth people, affiliate people, but for those who don't know, I'd love to get a sense of what you do, what's Commission Junction, give us a bit of a breakdown. Yeah, so CJ is um, one of the world's largest affiliate networks. Uh, We work with a huge multitude of brands, but um, primarily my team is working with our um, blue chip chip and um, enterprise brands to provide affiliate marketing strategy and tracking publisher payment and all that good stuff um, for their their affiliate partnership programs. Um, CJ also runs um, some CJ Leads uh, lines. CJ also runs CJ Influence. So we do um, influence, we do social. Those both sit in my remit, but primarily it's it's core affiliate. Awesome, it's core awesome. Affiliate. And what what kind of like at, like brands are you kind of working with? Maybe throughout your career, or also throughout you know your your um, management of clients at Commission Junction. Yeah, so I've been with CJ for about 10 years. Um, I started off as an account manager. I come from London, which is why I speak like this. Uh, In our London office, I was working with uh, Argos and Tui, who are um, a huge retail and a huge travel brand uh, out of the UK and Europe, respectively. Uh, But over time, I've developed, I have touched, I would say probably in excess of 100 to 120 different brands. Now being VP, you know, as my team's making me look off the, the, the vast volume. Uh, but everybody from Expedia, who've been a, a long time client, Disney, who've been a very long time client, uh, to Nike, to uh, CIT Bank, USAA, Experian, TurboTax, into it. Uh, the list kind of goes on and on. I love we, that. We tend to, again, focus on enterprise brands, but I do also have a, a large number of mid market and kind of mid to large brands. That's awesome. That's awesome. What are some of the things you think uh, brands need to be thinking about in the affiliate marketing space? What do you think some of the things they might be uh, missing out on or or not thinking about? Um, I'd love to learn more about some of your observations and learnings working with all these great brands. Yeah, I can kind of meta answer that question. There are a lot of different things that brands are missing out on, but um, one of the reasons that I was excited to be featured on this podcast is I think the biggest thing that most brands miss out on is working out what they're missing. It's instituting some kind of testing function, um, learning function, something along those lines within their affiliate program so that they can start saying, okay, we don't do X currently, and maybe we don't have the data that we need or the uh, maybe the expertise that we need on, on their own side to forecast what X would do from a ROAS perspective, but we are still going to test that. We are still going to work out whether it works. Um, test and learn functionality is something that we try to instill with the majority of the brands that we work with. Test and learn functionality, I think, is probably the thing that I see most regularly um, missed within the affiliate industry or misimplemented within the affiliate industry. I, I love that. Obviously, it's... You know the namesake of the pod. It's really central to you know how my team and I think about and see see so much so many companies that um, tap into experimentation are the ones that are really capturing more value, capturing more demand. Um, they're on that kind of more bleeding edge of the curve, right? So I think it's such an interesting topic. Um, when you think about like an experiment or a test, like Maybe just explaining for the audience, like what what is sort of your definition of of a proper test that a brand that you might manage should be thinking about running, and how do you kind of just define it? 
Yeah, from a methodology standpoint, it's typically pretty simple, actually. The, the majority of the time, the reason that I see the need for a test is we don't have a good enough amount of visibility into whether this will definitely return you know, the CPA, the ROAS that we need, um, the effective CPA or the ROAS that we need on a large scale. And so I would advocate for putting aside a smaller amount of budget that's not going to affect your overall uh, ROAS, your overall program. Uh, just to flat out test whether it is going to return a CPA for you. Now, the actual output is going to depend on the client. It may be that you just want straight up last click CPA through your affiliate network, through your you know, chosen attribution provider or wherever else. It may be that the, the action that you're looking for in, you know, in CPA is a lead. It may be that it's a volume of impressions, but really it's, it's putting money down. It's working out the amount of money that you're willing to spend on X to try to work out whether it will work for you. It's agreeing on what the KPIs that you're looking for as an output from that would be. And then it's running a test in good faith, which I think pretty much everybody that ends up doing this does, where you are making the best possible effort to allow that publisher, to allow that strategy, to allow that partner uh, to achieve whatever that, that CPA looks like. I love that. And what are you? What do you find to be some of the pitfalls for clients and brands that that are kind of going through that test process? Like, where do they kind of falter? Where do they go wrong? How do you kind of coach them on that? Yeah. So the pitfalls themselves, um, I see. I guess three different pitfalls that are that are pretty regular. One of them would be going into the test with a bias going into the test assuming hey, this is how this is going to act and so not well, that I made a second ago kind of not throwing everything that you can at it not giving the partner the best possible chance for success if you go into somebody and you say I'm only going to invest 10 bucks in this and I need you to return absolutely everything that I you know that I've asked for there is no way that partner is going to do that you need to go and you need to say I'm willing to fund this to the extent that you tell me you need to to drive results after that, you can work out what scaling back looks like. You can't go in and say, I'm only going to give you, you know, a little bit of money. I'm only going to give you a little bit of investment or time or assets or whatever else it requires for success. And then be surprised if they come back to you and say, well, I didn't have enough to drive, you know, what, what my full potential was. Um, so the, the kind of bias or the caution, I guess, as well, um, is problematic. On the other side of that, I have seen problems where people haven't had enough caution with the overall structure of their test and learn programs, and they've been willing to just kind of throw money at anything that comes across their plate. It's a really interesting yeah. thing to manage as, as um, a strategist and as an agency slash network, uh, because yeah. we're effectively yeah. going to people and saying, stop doing mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so you have to have parameters stop in place to ensure. Right, exactly. Stop making, like, stop paying me money, stop paying everybody money. Affiliate network structures, and, and I'm sure agency structures as well, have changed a little bit so that. You know, it's not always dependent on the amount of money that comes through us, but it still feels odd to say to people, don't do as much as you are at the moment. But it is super important to say, to discuss as part of the setup of the test and learn program, whether the parameters that you have, whether the spend that you have assigned um, are at the right level that they're not going to be detrimental to your wider program. While I will advocate all day for testing, all day for testing, I don't want somebody to run a budget or to risk a budget that is going to overall affect the veracity of the channel, the integrity of the channel, you know, their, their ability to have good conversations with their boss. So one would be yeah. make sure you're not too cautious. Two would be make sure you're cautious enough. Um, and then three would be ensuring that your test and learn budget is rolling rather than something that you put aside. So I've seen some brands say, okay, we have a $20,000 test and learn budget for this month. They will find $5,000 of things that work. They will find another $5,000 the next month, do that for four months and say, right, our entire test and learn budget is, um, is working, but is taken up. You kind of need yeah. to graduate people that are in a, a testing function that you have into your main program when they start to work. Otherwise, you know, in that example, all you're going to do is find four partners. Yep. Yep. And so like without naming a brand, what's kind of like the best structured test you've seen or what's like a textbook example where, man, this, this brand really set it up well, they had the right expectations going in, kind of 
played it perfectly. Like what what would be what would be an example in your mind uh, without saying the brand's name? I'd love to hear kind of like what happened, what was the result? Yeah, so about um, about nine months ago now, actually, because it was just before Q4, don't testing Q4 folks, um, <laughs> or at least don't don't make big bets in Q4. Um, Fair. About nine months ago, we had a brand that put aside a pretty significant budget uh, in kind of objective terms. Uh, there were bigger brands that were able to afford it to test a completely new publisher model. It was something that they and their competitors had not really made any headway into. The conversations around the misalignment of the potential for that publisher vertical and the achievement of that that client and, uh, and their competitors uh, was rife. We had an enormous conversation about, you know, how can this be a six, seven, eight figure potential publisher, and yet we are only making X amount of money. Um, and the um, publisher came to us and said, look, the reason for it is there is effectively a startup cost to this. It's not an integration cost. It is, you know, you need to be spending X amount of money in order to engage with our audience. Um, the temptation at the beginning of that conversation for that brand and actually for a couple of their competitors that I to know about was to say, okay, we will we will put aside this significant budget. We will give this to you. We are going to dictate to you exactly how you should spend it. And the really, it was a really cool thing. It's kind of sad to say, but the really cool thing that I saw throughout the process was the brand's realization that that is not the best way to set the publisher up for success. That if we're going to judge whether a publisher is capable of making money, what we need to do is say to them, here's the money. You tell me how you're going to spend it. I just need you to tell me at the end of it, I put my best foot forward. There can't be any conversation at the end where you say you hampered us, you changed, you know, you changed how we would like to have worked. We have to know what you can do if, if the gloves come off. Obviously, there have to be branding restrictions. Obviously, there have to be, you know, um, fraud and compliance and everything else restrictions and, and there's zero question about that. But really the control was handed over. It was here is the amount of money that we have. Give me the most amount of money back within you know these these few parameters that we have. Um, and it was a wild success. Uh, I believe that brand is now something like six percent of their total program. That publisher is now about six percent of their total program. What, and what, uh, what type of publisher it sounds like there was a lot of co conversation around like you know, controversy for lack of a better term about partnering with this, this, this affiliate, this partner. Can you share more about like the type of partner it was or like maybe some of the why behind that analysis going into the test? Yeah, I don't want to name exactly what kind of partner it is because it's going to betray the exact partner. There are very few people in the space, but it's a, a really emerging publisher um, model uh, to the extent that there are probably only two or three publishers that are in that space. The reason for the hesitation, I think, is really the, the reason that we need testing, testing on budgets within uh, the affiliate industry at large. It was that there was zero data to, um, there was zero data to forecast a CPA from. There was a lot of data that indicated that there was audience alignment. There was a hell of a lot of data that indicated that there was not much um, actual uh, customer overlap. So you had perfect audience. We haven't really spoken to them. We know that that audience engages with brands that are different to us, but shop in the same way, you know, the same kind of demographics, same kind of income levels. But there was nothing to say, okay, if we try to execute this, this is what this is going to cost. So the controversy came purely from the fact that affiliates are CPA channel. And I think our temptation as affiliate managers, affiliate marketers, clients, agencies, everybody is to always be able to say, this is the amount of money that we're going to make from this test, or at least this is with a high confidence the range that we're going to we're going to make because of the and CPA structure. That. Sorry, go on. Because of the CPA structure of affiliate. Because of the CPA structure of affiliate, and because it's the paradigm within which we engage on a day-to-day -day basis, right? When we're talking about established partners, we're always talking about how much they made, what their CPA was, what we think their CPA is going to be next month. What we think the ROAS of this newsletter will be, you know, if we run it on this day rather than that day, we always have that backstop of data that allows us to reach a hopefully very accurate ROAS range. And when we lack that data, 
I think the affiliate channel is kind of unique in that um, it causes caution because nobody wants to put money, understandably, nobody wants to put money up up front um, for a risk when, you know, there are 20 other conversations in the wings about publishers that we're already established with and how you could spend yeah. that money with yeah. some kind of guaranteed range. Well, interesting concepts. I, I, what I'm hearing you saying is like, brands need to come into affiliate marketing uh, with a very test and learn mentality, right? Brands need to come into affiliate marketing with a um, kind of check their biases at the door as much as they can recognize them, right? And and you're saying, hey, let's have a, a, a small percentage of a, of a budget allocation to go towards willingness to spend to learn, not necessarily spend to get a return. And then, hey, once that signal is met, we're going to pause that test and move that success or that winning test into the greater budget allocation that you said it's just evergreen and running and expected to perform. Then you've got this other testing budget that's smaller that can keep keep firing, keep going after those new emerging counterintuitive things, right? Is that is that kind of what you're – sounds like that's kind of your your point there, which I think is really, really spot on. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, I think there's a lot of talk in tech and marketing in general five five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, about yeah. failing fast. And yeah. I don't think you want to try and fail fast with your entire program. I don't think you want to risk all of your budget. I think ring fencing a small amount of budget to learn how to fail fast, to learn what successes look like. Also to learn, you know, hey, we ran this and maybe we need to adjust X, Y, Z and run it again um, is deeply needed. Otherwise, what you end up relying on is kind of just organic growth. It's, you know, how can the established players in the game, your retail arts, your Ebates, your uh, wire cutters even, how can they drive me growth? And expecting that you're going to see something different from those partners that you've been working with five, 10, significantly different than those partners that you've been working with for five, 10, 15, 20 years without you know, again, without testing and learning with them, without trying new mm -hmm. strategies with them, I, mm -hmm. I don't think it makes any sense to do that. There is no brand that all of a sudden is going to drive you 10, 20, 30, 40% growth um, without changing how you work with them. And there are very few brands who you can change who you, uh, how you work with without putting some kind of investment in that front. Yeah, for sure. You, you kind of touched on something interesting before about setting aside that experimentation budget and counseling clients and brands to say it's okay if this loses money and I think that was kind of like like share more about that like how do you how do people react when you tell them that initially and how is how does that conversation go yeah uh, I get a lot of wide eyes when I talk about it the um, the concise way that I will put that usually is if your test and learn budget is consistently delivering your positive ROAS, you're doing it wrong. Fundamentally, yeah. that will mean, yeah. or your psychic. And if you're psychic, great, I want to work with you. But if your test and learn budget is consistently ROAS positive, or at least meeting your program ROAS targets, it probably means that you're not taking enough risks and that that should have been spent that just sat within your evergreen program. Or it means that you're coming up against what I spoke about earlier, which is, um, you know, you've set a test and learn budget, but you found four things that work and you're continuing to call them tests for far too long. You should graduate things that work into your core program. And so by definition, that, that experimentation budget, that experimentation that you're ring fenced should always be riskier, below program ROAS, below program CPA in order to, to, to source those, those positive ROAS new opportunities. The brands you've worked with are insanely awesome. You've, worked, you've seen a lot, hundreds of complex, uh, challenging uh, topics and issues in affiliate marketing. What, what do you think is kind of the, some of the emblems or signals of a really healthy, fantastic program? We've talked about testing, but kind of when you like look under the hood, and see what's available from a strategy, tactics, mix perspective. I'm excited to just, just get your perspective on what you've seen work really well for, for some of the best brands. Yeah, I think it's a relatively easy one because I definitely have a favorite way to, to make up a program. So Love it. 
unanimously the brands that I see who are most exciting to work with in the industry, not just for me, but you know, where I see publishers being infused, I see teams being infused, I see even the client contacts themselves being infused, are clients where they understand that there are different measures of value for different partners in the space. Linking back to something I said earlier on, I think we can get really focused on last click CPA um, and on the last click CPA of an individual publisher in an individual journey. What I see with really exciting programs, uh, partners, clients, even measurement tactics, where they start to understand, okay, what is the full holistic downstream value of each element of my plan? Is it somebody that drives the last click? Is it somebody that grabs somebody who's nearly there and gets them to be there at a better rate than I can do that myself? And if so, you know, understands the value of that, because I definitely hear some people that argue with the value of that and will say, if they're nearly there, I don't know don't want to interact with them. The other end of the spectrum though, it's understanding, okay, there are a load of affiliate partners out there. There is a load of media out there that is only available through the affiliate channel and the partnerships channel, but that is not necessarily going to convert 100% on the last click, but I understand it is going to contribute maybe just to their partnerships ecosystem or maybe to their overall site ecosystem. Um, again, under, not just understanding that that is true, but truly understanding, measuring, and analyzing what that looks like, and being able to have an open conversation internally about why you are running a strategy with that, if you're CPA based, or on the other end of the program, um, why you're running, you know, effectively bottom of funnel strategies that help conversion. Um, those open conversations, that ability to measure, that ability to understand every element of the, the funnel or the messy middle or whatever terminology we're using this year. Um, tends to create one, a healthy program because you have a great mix of publishers, two, healthy growth because you are dipping into every possible pool that you can for growth and you are leveraging, you know, you're leveraging that you are pulling the levers for growth at both ends of the spectrum. Um, but three, it's fun, it's engaging. Like when, when we're talking about awesome, I kind of want to include that as well. It allows you to play a little bit of jazz. It allows you, because you have that measurement, because you have that understanding, it allows you to play outside of the parameters of just, hey, if we press this button, this number goes up and start to say, okay, what happens if I mix these ingredients? What happens if I take this thing and this thing that you would never would have expected to have worked together and bring them together to drive success? I love that. Play a little jazz. That's a, such a great uh, mantra for, I think, uh, many things. Um, you kind of touched on briefly, like last click. Can you kind of describe, you know, some of the attribution models maybe that you've seen work well? Obviously, to your point earlier, it's very unique to the brand. But what, what's your take on attribution, generally speaking? Where do people kind of not get it right? Where do you like? Where going back to the core question of what's that best in class affiliate program look like? What, what do you see often when it comes to attribution? Yeah, I would. Kick off by saying for most clients, maybe, or at least for a large number of, of business types, last click isn't an attribution model at all. Last click is a payment model. Um, another one of my, my mantras uh, outside of Play Little Jazz, which is actually one of my director's ma uh, mantras, which I love, and, and whatever else I said upstream, is um, it doesn't matter whether you pay your partners via carrier pigeon. It doesn't. What matters is the amount that you pay them and whether that aligns to what you're getting from them. Whether you're paying last click, first click, fractional, carrier pigeon, placement, whatever else, at the end of the day, partners are looking at what they're getting in their bank account and they are prioritizing your business based on that and not necessarily against your competitors either, just you know, in the wider context of their own business and who they're making money from. Um, but equally for for um, clients, for advertisers, for networks as well. The fact that you pay on a last click doesn't mean that your attribution has to be on a last click CPA. It is just a payment model. And it is, I think, a pretty effective payment model. Um, if you have you know, somebody looking at your program who has um, any form of experience in the industry, they're going to be able to adjust the downstream impacts of that payment model to make sure that each partner is being paid the right amount, even if you're measuring on the world's most complex attribution system. Um, on actual attribution, 
the cool stuff that I see tends to be focused around, um, I'm a massive data nerd, I'm a massive data structure nerd. Um, it tends to be focused around maybe some game theory attribution. I see some great stuff with econometrics and MMM models that take that into account. Um, it tends to ask, um, it tend to ask, tends to ask questions about lifetime value or at least long-term value rather than, you know, this individual initial transaction, which I think can be a really myopic view of, of customers. I run, I run a load of brands who um, effectively do their customer acquisition through the channel because they're a subscription brand and then they get a long-term value. And I think every retailer, every travel brand, every finance brand, especially finance brands, could do really well looking at things in that way. Um, in, in what way? Can you, can you elaborate on that more? Yeah, I'm starting to think, okay, I'm going to make 10 bucks on this person right now and they might cost me five bucks to acquire. Um, but I know that this is the kind of customer that is going to engage with my brand for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. And accepting that that is a very different type of customer to the other type of customer that legitimately does come in through the affiliate channel, which is, you know, the kind of person that comes in once and then never buys again. That latter form, those are the kind of customers that you want to say, right, is my immediate ROAS on this one sale profitable? If it's not, it makes zero sense to make this sale. But if you're bringing in a customer with a slightly higher cost to entry that is going to continue to buy from you, maybe from within the affiliate channel, maybe from within the partner ecosystem, or maybe you know direct in the future, um, I see a load of value in, in attribution models or measurement models um, that take that into consideration and allow you to chase down the things that are the best for your business long term. Yep. Yep. Do you, okay, hot, hot topic. Is affiliate marketing a channel? Uh, no. Um, yes. I... <laughs> what, what's your view? What do you think? I, I like that you're answering it that way. I, I don't, I probably won't stop calling it a channel because it, people are kind of, they want an easy way to mentally conceptualize it vis-a-vis -vis paid search, paid social, organic. And I think that because it can touch all of those things and involves all of those things, it, it, it shouldn't be it's not technically a channel. It sounds like you're in agreement with that. Yeah, I'm in full agreement. So I just leave it a no and we can move on. No, um, <laughs> I have... I want to debate. Um, <laughs> I'm about to go on the record being super praiseful of, um, of my mentor and our head of strategy. Um, and if anybody knows me that's listening, uh, they're going to know that I'm, uh, I'm pretty British and dry and I don't often go all out and say, yeah, I'm behind the company line on this. Um, but my my mentor, certainly since I moved to the US, Summer Arias is our um, head of strategy for CJ now. I think she's absolutely nailed it with the description of what affiliate is. She calls it the channel of channels. You'll probably see in any CJ marketing that we've done over the past few months and certainly what we're doing going forwards. The channel of channels or the channel for channels is, is featured within that. And what she means by that is it is a structure. Affiliate is a structure which tends to be focused around uh, a performance marketing payout structure, but really it spans all of your channels. And that's not just to say, you know, affiliate can do paid search or affiliate can do display. It can, it absolutely can. The reason I said channel of channels, the reason she says channel of channels or channel for channels is, it enables those channels to amplify their own success. If you have a great affiliate program, you are able to use that to amplify the results from your paid search channel, to extend the results from your paid search channel, and extend the reach of it. Same for display, the same for social and influencer, very, very, very much with social and influencer. It, it gives you the ability to reach a much wider, is that keywords in paid search, because you can do that on a guaranteed CPA, a much wider audience of influencers, because you don't need to get a one-on-one -on -one agreement in place with them in your social channels and have a payment system up front. You can say, look, this is the CPA structure, this is what we want you to talk about. Really, when you think about even your, you know, your site, your site amplification, your site um, conversion, really when you think about any part of your business, there is a partner within the affiliate space that can help to work with them to amplify their own results or replicate their results. Love it, love it. Good segue. What are what are some emerging affiliate partners that you're super excited about? 
I am all in on a few different publisher models from a philosophical standpoint I'm seeing coming out at the moment. I have no idea whether these are going to be you know, the biggest publisher models in the world or whether they're not. Um, and if I did, I'd be making a lot of money off of, off of that ability to predict. Um, but interestingly, as I was thinking about this podcast, these were the people that I, that I was thinking about, that I was thinking about when I was considering how beneficial testing loan budgets and experimentation budgets are in establishing. Um, so a few different models that I really like at the moment, um, or a few different emerging models that I really like at the moment are um, extended video media or connected TV. I'm starting to see a couple of brands within the affiliate space who are able to kind of do what I was just describing with paid search, where they say, look, we understand that you have your own assets. We understand that you have your own channel. We understand that you're not covering every possible customer that you can because you have to do some risk management. So let us take those assets or maybe even let us work with you to create assets so that we can cover those gaps on the CPA. Um, that's so exciting because it's worked so well for brands that I've seen do it, you know, take the proper, proper proportions, but execute it within paid search. And I've seen it to some extent with yeah. targeting yeah. as well, although it's a little bit less in vogue. Um, I'm also seeing some really interesting stuff happening with um, browser extensions. I know uh, people can get cagey at that term, but one, I don't think it should be. You know, when we're talking about testing, I think it's um, super important to test your hypotheses. That was later on, but I have some um, some interesting data on existing browser extensions. But what I'm seeing is happening with browser extensions at the moment is we're getting these emerging partners who recognize that the benefit of a browser extension is really to increase consumer convenience or to serve an immediate consumer need. And they're starting to ask the question, okay, what consumer needs exist outside of coupons, price comparison, cashback, which really tends to be the browser extension kind of mantra right now. So um, we can name check these publishers. There's a there's a an extension called Benny that I'm a huge fan of the publisher model for, um, and what they do is they help they help customers discover um, pre loved, second hand, refurbished uh, items. It's particularly focused within um, the fashion space, at least for now, as they're browsing a customer's sorry a client site. So I know that they're working with Patagonia at the moment, which is wearing a Patagonia vest. So, you know, you're looking at this Patagonia vest and they flag up, hey, Patagonia have their own pre-loved program. You could buy this pre-loved for X amount of money. And that engagement in circular economy, but also that engagement in recognizing that consumers have, some consumers have needs to save money, but that that need doesn't always need to be in the form of a straight up discount on a product, I think is awesome. Absolutely. Very cool. Very interesting stuff. All right. You're from the UK, came over when? 2017, 2018? 2018, I think. Okay. What, what What's better, football or rugby? <laughs> uh, I went to college in Wales, so I have to say rugby. Um, plus, there's more um, there's more blood, which I think is always, that's what you're looking for in sport. Yeah, right? that's the idea with the whole that whole genre. How about uh, baseball or cricket? What What's better? Come on. Ooh. If you asked me before I went to an NBA baseball game, I would have said, sorry, NBA. <laughs> we, we, okay, that's my British. Um, I would have said cricket. Uh, I've seen four baseball games in my life, and I've loved every one of them. And I've seen five cricket games live in my life, and I've hated every minute of those experiences. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to cut that bit out. So I think baseball might be winning me over. It might be the best. That's the most insightful. Uh, that's very, that's a, hey, you know, a little something for the British audience, a little something for the American audience. Everybody's happy. You nailed it. We talked about emerging partners. We talked about testing, talking about best in class programs. Uh, you, you have a little sneak peek of what's coming behind the curtain. You're working on some really interesting data around, you know, how incremental are some of these browser extensions and plugins. So, covered a ton of awesome topics today and we we got through our audio issues as well
Yeah. Yeah, I've got about do like five more minutes on it. And it, hey, like we can we can always we can always pick it up later. But let's do Tom, I'm I'm super excited about all the stuff you you're thinking about around browser extensions, uh toolbars, um coming from that place of testing, learning, objectivity. There's obviously a lot of controversy and, and people kind of uh, rile at the, the thought of them. How are you thinking about them? How are you approaching it? What are some of the learnings that you're working on on that topic? Yeah, they're definitely controversial. I came into the industry 10, 12 years ago, um, depending on which role you considered my entry. And I think it was right when browser extensions were just starting to come into the market. And so I've been there from the beginning when I was and still remain to some extent a massive skeptic of, of anything uh, that comes into the market that supports to be engaging with a customer that's already deep in the sales process. Um, and for at least seven years, I've been having uh, head-on conversations with clients about how we test that, about how we measure that. Um, I spoke earlier on about kind of overcoming biases and I would, I have been challenging clients um, to test their biases, to test their theories about browser extensions. I hear a lot of people using a common sense standpoint where they'll say this person was already on my site and so they're going to buy anyway. And I've been desperate to test that over time. I legitimately think we've just hit on a methodology that allows us to do that. Um, so we're, this isn't public, public yet, but we can talk about some preliminary results on the podcast. Um, we identified a tech partnership with somebody who sits on um, a large number of client sites. Uh, we have I think about 70 million journeys that we've looked at, um, who can see when a browser extension fires. They can see if somebody has a browser extension installed and they can determine the difference in behavior between people who have an extension installed and did not see a message and people who have an extension installed install and did see a message. You might need to cut this bit out. Well, I'll follow up on this afterwards, but um, that is while also determining whether that message was proactive or reactive. So they're able to say, look, this person would not have received a browser extension message unless the extension chose to fire. Um, and when we look at that en masse, when we look at that across 70 million journeys, we see a significant uplift in revenue per session from customers who received a, uh, a message from a browser extension versus those that didn't. So yeah, when, we, when we're saying, I think this person was on my site and so they were gonna buy anyway, my, my knee-jerk response to that was always you know, site conversion rates are about 3 to 4% on a great day, so 96% of them weren't going to convert anyway. And what we're seeing from this data is that um, is the extensions, is that people that interact with your customers who are already deep in journey are able to significantly uplift revenue for the, for the customers that they interact with. Um, and really interestingly, on the flip side, we were able to see how Amazon Assistant affects people which purely exists to drag people away from your site into Amazon. And it shows the inverse in the way that makes the most possible sense. If Amazon Assistant says, hey, you shouldn't buy from these people, you should buy elsewhere, we saw a massive decline in revenue per journey because we we're seeing the exact inverse happen. The overall indication was consumers seem to listen and respond to messages from browser extensions in a way that genuinely, genuinely surprised me. Like I went into this without bias. I went into this wanting to test hypotheses. Obviously, from a network perspective, I hope that it gave us the, you know, the answer that, yeah, what we've been doing for five, 10 years isn't isn't completely without worth. I think the extent to which we saw we saw an uplift and we'll have a white paper coming out at some point in the near future that really delves into this was awesome. surprising to absolutely everybody involved. I love it. Excited to read it, excited to dig into it more. I think it might be uh, time for a, a mini part three just to delve into that topic on itself. Even, who knows, maybe with white paper in hand. Um, yep. But it's been a pleasure. Loved, loved chatting about all these topics with you, Tom, and really appreciate your time today. It's been awesome. Yep, it's been fantastic. I've loved doing it.
Thanks, man. Appreciate you.